Hello, good morning everyone. I'm thrilled to be here today to talk of, about a topic that is crucial to the health and performance of Kubernetes applications and applications in general, testing observability features. As developers and DevOps engineers, we understand the importance of monitoring our applications, uh, diagnosing issues, and ensuring that uh, our alerts are accurate and timely. Today, we'll delve into how we can achieve this using Prometheus, alert managers, and various testing frameworks and libraries. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm João Vilaça. I work at Red Hat. Uh, in specific, I'm contributing to the QBIRT project. I don't know if you had the chance, but in the first floor here, we have a small booth where we are giving some demos and uh, giving some swag. So if you have the chance, please stop by. Uh, I started working on a tool uh, of Qbeard named Hyperconverged Cluster Operator, but then slowly I started um, having more focus on monitoring and observability features across the, the old components. So, uh, the outline for today. Uh, we'll start by setting up uh, and seeing how to do a test environment, uh, how to test metrics, uh, then moving on to alert testing and how to ensure that they are actionable, relevant, and real alerts. And in the end, I'll show you a small demo of how I did everything together. Uh, so let's start with setting up the test environment. Uh, first, we need to understand uh, like, uh, what the test environment should look like. It needs to be, obviously, a controlled space where it can simulate the conditions of a production environment, obviously. But we don't want the risk of causing disruptions to our actual users. And uh, in our tests, we'll need to create and delete a lot of resources, remove permissions, cause network problems. So this is where the concept of a disposable local cluster comes into play. A disposable cluster is nothing more than a temporary Kubernetes cluster that we just create for the purpose of testing. Uh, the beauty of this approach is that uh, we can spin a new cluster whenever uh, we want and whenever we need to run a test, and we can just tear it down once we are finished with it. This ensures that uh, every test of ours starts with uh, a clean slate and we don't have to worry about uh, any leftovers from previous tests and uh, weird permission changes that we might do to test uh, our components. Uh, spinning up a cluster can be used with a lot of tools. Uh, some of them easy to use and available right now are, for example, Kind, which is Kubernetes in Docker, Minikube, Microcatos, or any other. On Kubeirt, we actually have this cool tool already. I literally use this every day when I'm at work. And it already creates a cluster and has even a flag and sets up uh, everything Prometheus related. So it's, I really like it. And uh, in the automated tests, nowadays we don't, we don't use it. We provision full clusters. But that's more like, uh, I see, like a bonus for when the projects are more mature. And uh, small projects that are starting, I don't think they really need it at the beginning. So let's start now with metrics and events. Metrics are obviously the ways of observability, right? They give us insights on how the application is behaving, and they help us diagnose issues. And we'll explore how to test those metrics. Uh, I put here the question like, are unit tests enough? Obviously, it's a dumb question. Of course, unit tests are not enough. But in the ideal world, everything will be fully tested, right? But uh, then again, we can't have everything. And we know time and workforce are limited. So in the end, I guess, at least in the beginning, unit tests are kind of enough. Uh, in my opinion, it's more important to start uh, with end-to-end -end tests for alerts. And usually, a lot of our alerts already use metrics for, for the calculations. So if our alerts are working correctly, we have some degree of confidence that the metrics they are using are to working correctly, right? And, um, but even though we can, we can start simple, and uh, most of the times, like the simple things are the ones that uh, end up saving us the most time in the future. And when we talk about metrics, it's very important to first validate that we follow the right uh, naming conventions and we have the correct labels. And if possible, if checking if the metrics are prefixed with a component name. 
so that later on we can easily find out where the metric is being created and just more quickly trace it back. And um, add the unit tests for functions that uh, update those metrics, and in the end of the test, validate that their value was correctly updated, as we'll see later on on the demo. Uh, now, let's start uh, with uh, the alerts. One of the, the main concerns in this topic is that we don't want to be flooded with false alarms or missed critical alerts, right? So we'll discuss how to ensure our alerts are actionable, relevant, and they are real. Um, and we also cover how to configure them correctly and ensure that they react to the, to the appropriate triggering conditions. Um, this is probably the most known quote in the area, and uh, if you worked with alerts, you already probably saw it, that uh, every time the pager goes off, uh, I should be able to react with a sense of urgency, I can only react with a sense of urgency a few times a day before I become fatigued, and every page should be actionable. This is taken from the site reliability engineering book, so it's like uh, one of the bibles of observability, right? And uh, we have to be aware that uh, an urgent alert might actually wake up someone in the middle of the night. And uh, this is even more important when we are producing software for, all, for external clients. We don't know how, met, how many people on duty they will have. Um, actually worked on a small company before and you were two people managing infrastructure and we didn't have uh, someone already uh, ready at all hours of the day, right? And uh, since we had clients on, on the other side of the globe, if we had an alert in the middle of the night, one of us would need to wake up uh, and look at it. So it better be a real alert. Uh, so how should an alert be configured? It should have an owner, a contact person that is basically able to quickly understand the problem that created the alert or uh, the process it refers to. Sometimes it might be the developer of the feature, other times it might be someone from a monitoring team. So this is really important because sometimes we don't want to start with something that we don't know very well and knock your, your head off and then lose valuable time. And uh, as in metrics, we should be able to quickly identify the component to which the, the alert uh, refers to. For example, if we have uh, a Kubernetes operator that is managing, for example, resources on IBM Cloud, we might want to have an alert like uh, IBM Cloud is not available. So we want to identify which component uh, created the, the alert so we can quickly understand where it came from and go there to navigate the logs and try to understand in more detail the problem. Uh, also a summary and a description, and I think those are actually pretty straightforward, but uh, we should also have a link to a handbook, uh, which we'll see in more detail in the, in the next slides. Um, usually for the severity, uh, some people use different severity levels, but Prometheus actually recommends these ones. Um, and they are useful to distinguish uh, like which actions we should perform for each alert and to sort uh, priorities on, on them, right? For critical alerts, those are usually the ones that will push people in the middle of the night. The warning alerts, we sometimes just want maybe to create a ticket that should be looking into the next day. They are us usually useful for uh, like uh, some component is reaching critical memory. If you don't do anything in a day or two, they will reach a critical state. And if we usually don't uh, really perform any immediate action, we just also create a ticket that goes to the bottom of the line. Um, about uh, the alert handbooks, I think those are really, really the important part because they serve as a comprehensive guide for the cluster owners or the operators. And uh, they should provide a step-by-step -step instructions on how to handle the specific alert. Like, you all know that if you don't provide these handbooks, usually owners or operators will need to go through a lot of the documentation pages or their personal notes to understand how they can debug and fix the problem. And this always leads to losing valuable time. Usually those, that time also means losing a lot of money, right? And um, even worse than that, sometimes we force uh, the, um, them to rely on memory or improvisation because they uh, will handle some related uh, issue in the past and that will also lead to mistakes and more delays. 
So, uh, how can we test uh, the alerts? Um, in our tests, we should make sure that uh, all the alerts include all the mandatory fields that uh, we said uh, before, that each handbook URL link is valid and the, the handbook actually exists, that the alert includes a reference to the instance or pod. It might be like the name of the component or really in a label about the pod or even in the description. And the alert is triggered when the expected conditions are met, right? And then again, most of these steps are actually very simple. But as, as I said, for metrics, it might just save us a lot of time and headaches in, in the future. Uh, so now let's put this theory into practice and I'll try to show you a small demo that usually goes very badly. So uh, to start with, I have here the, the creation, I don't know if you can see if I should increase, or do I not want to increase? Can you see or is better to increase? Let's see. Didn't even start already, first issue. Maybe it's good. So, uh, in our project, we want to create uh, the metrics, right? I actually have this file here that I should start with. Um, so, this is a simple operator for uh, Kubernetes. I legit didn't have uh, no logic at all for now, just uh, some uh, simple metrics and alerts just to show you how you can start with, right? And um, from then, I used, in this case, uh, Kind to create uh, a new cluster, and uh, I just installed, uh, installed Prometheus. I'm doing this locally, but uh, obviously you can follow these steps on uh, a cluster you have for testing. It's even possible to do it on GitHub Actions or GitLab. So really simple steps that uh, you can easily do in uh, five, 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, after having the cluster, I then created my metric. Um, I have here the controller label to refer to, to the operator. Um, we are now uh, looking also, for example, to have stability levels that will allow us to uh, deprecate metrics in the future. So all these labels are really important for you to put some time into thinking about them and uh, because these are the kind of things that will help you, you your team, and uh, and your customers. And then, for example, for these metrics, we have the, here the reconcile loop of the operator. For those of you that are not familiar with operators, it lets us create a resource, a custom resource on Kubernetes. And then, for example, when I create that resource, it runs this reconcile loop for me to perform any actions. Imagine that here, as I said before, I want to work with IBM Cloud. I might want to create uh, like, uh, uh, a machine on IBM or uh, a route, something like that, and this is the place where I will be doing that. And for example, here, whatever the logic is, I want to increment this metric that will tell me how many times the reconcile loop was, uh, was created. And as I said before, it's real here we can start simple and uh, write the tests for uh, our metrics. In the first step, we can start with the easy validation that, for example, the metrics follows the Prometheus conventions. And um, we list all the metrics and then we link the metrics. Uh, here I'm using Promlint tool, which already brings a lot of validations that, for example, the metrics have all the necessary uh, structure, for example, counters should not have the total uh, keyword at the end. And as I said, this is really important to take a look in the beginning when we start adding metrics. Uh, in Qubit, uh, we had a lot of developers adding metrics and uh, without any validations. And uh, in one component only, this is uh, uh, not here. Let's see. 
So what ended up happening is that uh, when we added the linter, we had uh, all these issues. Uh, Non-Instagram, non-summary metrics should not have the accounts to fix, uh, and you see that those are a lot of errors in terms of uh, units and so on. So, um, and now uh, uh, we saw before that we are having stability levels. Why are we having that? Because this project is used by clients. And uh, which metrics are clients using? Those ones that we created before. So we can just simply go there and rename the metrics because they are using them and it will cause them a lot of trouble. So we are now thinking about we should deprecate these metrics for two versions, create new metrics with the correct names, warn the customers that these metrics will no longer be supported, then uh, move trying to see if they are already using those metrics, not causing them issues, and this will take a lot of time. So, and uh, you saw that uh, really it will take uh, like very few lines to call Prometheus linter and uh, save us all from this kind of troubles. But that's uh, life and that's why we are trying to now uh, expose these issues that we have uh, with the community and writing some uh, best practices so these problems don't happen again, right? So. Moving forward, here it's the, the unit test for the metric, right? We get the initial reconcile value count, and then we run the reconcile um, loop. As you saw, it was very simple, so it's obviously updating the metrics, but in the future, your logic will be much more complex. But even though, in the end, you, for example, in this case, expect the initial values to, to be added one, and that will be the final value, right? So. Pretty simple stuff. Um, from there, we uh, move on to, for example, re recording rules. Um, let me see. So this is where are, we are creating the, registering the rules. So um, for this project, I created two simply two simple recording rules. Right, the first one, the number of operator pods in the cluster, which is simple. Uh, simply um, query for uh, for Prometheus, which counts the number of pods up in the cluster of that type, and also the number of uh, heavy pods, which is the sum of uh, the up pods in the cluster, because this up metric will have the value one if the pod is ready to, to be used, right? And uh, also, you can notice here that uh, some of the we are also already trying to use stability levels on the alerts. For example, alpha, here is just an example, but the idea is to show that this is not uh, like fully tested and it's still being worked on and other. Um, from these recording rules, um, we are uh, building our alerts. And uh, one of the most uh, important alerts to start with is obviously testing if uh, the operator is down or if the operator is not heavy. We make use of the recording rules we saw before. If the number of pods, uh, operator pods in the cluster are zero, we'll be triggering the alert. And if the, here, if the number of heavy pods is less than the number of pods, we'll uh, give the alert test operator is not heavy. Um, for those, uh, we have uh, also some validations. For recording rules, we are uh, linking the metrics as linking the recording rules as we did for metrics, because they should follow the same conventions as before. And then here, for example, I want all recording rules to be uh, prefixed with uh, the name of uh, the operator. And also the same for alerts that should follow Prometheus conventions. Uh, and actually, here I also put uh, the link here that I said before that uh, we are trying to, to achieve, adding the best practices for observability on operator SDK. So a lot of these validations come, come from there, right? Alerts must be in Pascal case format. They must have an expression. We are validating labels, validating annotations. So just following uh, uh, the recommendations there. And these are basically the unit tests. Ah, I could have run those just to see that uh, as a good developer, I uh, follow by the rules I created. This one, 
for the matrix, it will be very funny that it failed. And this one for, for the rules, pretty simple stuff. So now moving forward for the end-to-end -end test, that's what uh, we want to know, right? Uh, I already here have a cluster. Actually, I see that uh, I have uh, the, the resource created and um, the pod, but on running, it will clear it all. I'll start running because it takes a few minutes, I think. So, and uh, let's see. Uh, for metrics, uh, we are doing the same thing. Here some setup, deploying the operator, then port forwarding uh, the Prometheus service so that we can access it locally and uh, deleting any previous resources that exist. And our test says that we should increase the test operator reconcile count when the, the reconcile count is run. So we just get the, the initial value for the test operator reconcile count and we create a new resource. As we saw before in the reconcile loop, any resource that is created is supposed to update the metric. So in the end, we know that eventually, the, when getting the metric, it should be equally the initial value plus one. This is a real simple test for metrics, but uh, as I said before, it makes sure that everything is working as supposed. We saw that this is very similar to the unit tests, but in unit tests, we, it's easier for us to know that uh, the metrics uh, are updated. Here, it's more tricky because it has a lot of also other operations before, because we need to make sure that uh, Kubernetes is, of, is actually passing the right events that is being catched by our operator, and then later executes, is executing the reconcile function correctly. And we have reconcile count, but we can, can have number of resources created, number of resources deleted, anything we want, right? And uh, for uh, alerts, we first have the verification I mentioned for the, the handbook. We are checking that the handbook URL uh, is available. I created just some uh, gist on GitHub for the purpose of this demo. And I can actually show because I copied it from one of our handbooks, cleaned up some stuff. But let's see, because it's also useful to know what a handbook should look like. First, we have the meaning of the, of the alert that uh, supposedly the, this alert fires when no test operator pod is running the cluster, the impact that this alert has. Sometimes in QVirt, uh, the operator might not have like a big of an impact because the operator is not responsible for the virtual machines. But uh, if the, the alert is like virtual controller is down, then users might start to have a problem because virtual machines are uh, running wild in the cluster and nothing is, con in is controlling them. And then we have all the diagnosis steps, and uh, here we should have uh, clear steps that in the end we understand very correctly what the, um, the problem is. So moving back to the tests, um, we are now um, following the same approach, more or less for metrics, deploying a new test operator, uh, and then uh, we uh, make, are making sure that uh, the test operator is down, is thrown when, when we want it, right? And in this case, for example, we just scale the deployment down to zero, and uh, since we have no pods in the cluster, we verif verify that the alert is being, is being triggered. In this case, uh, pending is enough for me, because for, you might want to have a delay on the alerts, just throw the alert if the condition is met for uh, more than five minutes, for example. But if I see if the alert is pending, like uh, the condition was triggered, it's just waiting for those five minutes, I think the, the alert is working fine, so I'm, I'm okay with it. And for the operator not ready, I just come here and set a random image, which might mean, for example, that the, um, the repository is not available, as happened earlier in the other demo. So it's a problem that sometimes we think, oh, this never happens, but uh, it happens more uh, than, uh, than <laughs> it, it happens a lot. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Uh, and we then validate that the alert uh, is then thrown. Once again, if it's firing or pending, 
And uh, as the time goes by, we start adding a lot uh, of alerts. For example, we might want to um, see if, uh, oh, it failed. If uh, the, um, so, yeah, I'll see again. Uh, we might want to see if um, the operator is creating the right resources on Kubernetes. And for that, it needs permissions. One of the things that uh, we can do is just go there, just delete the RBAC permissions, and uh, see if the correct alert uh, is triggered, saying that uh, ah, the, this permission does not exist anymore, and you, you should look into it, right? So that's uh, one of the things that we test. We can test, for example, for the HTTP requests, if they are failing. That's actually a metric that Prometheus already gave us. So the number of, um, of things you can uh, alert for is up for the, your uh, imagination, actually. And just to finish, uh, I want to present like this really useful tool. I actually don't we don't use it on Qvirt, but I use it on my master thesis, which is Chaos Mesh, and it's really cool. It's really simple to use, and it allows you to uh, create a lot uh, of problems in your cluster. For example, uh, deleting pods, causing network issues that might be a lot of latency, requests uh, being dropped. Um, it, you can cause CPU and memory issues. Uh, you should really take a look. It's simple to use, simple to configure, and it has a lot of potential for the, for the unit testing. So to wrap up, I just want to say that uh, it's really important to add observability features. It uh, really helps us. Uh, usually when we start projects, we tend to overlook those kind of things, but uh, they end up being very important and to help us in the future. And also important that they are actually working fine. As I said, we don't want uh, our DevOps and the clients to be waking up in the middle of the night just to see that uh, the alert uh, was not real, or we don't want to have uh, bad problems happening in the cluster, but um, they, uh, they are not uh, alerted for, and they are losing money, and they are losing clients. So those are the main takeaways. So that's it. If you have any questions, feel free. You mentioned that you would deprecate these metrics that you were talking about the rules that some clients may be using and eventually remove them. Why would you ever remove them? Yeah, because those metrics are not uh, up to standards, right? And uh, the idea here is to do, when we have the stability level deprecated, we will add the, the, a flag in the help text saying they are not. Because if we keep metrics that we want to update, we'll have a lot of more things to, to manage in the future, right? And we really have already a lot of metrics, and it's hard to keep up with them. We are also trying to add tools to generate documentation and to centralize the metric creations, but there are so many of them. and. Um, if we have 10, 20, it's manageable, right? But uh, when we get to the hundreds, we have a lot of components that becomes a problem. And uh, maybe it's not a thing, as you said, to, we cannot remove them maybe in a version or two or three because those problems happen. But uh, eventually in the future, I think we need to end up uh, removing them or else it will be unmanageable. Because even it's an open source project, right? And people come and go. And if we don't do anything about them, they will eventually be forgotten. And uh, nobody will know why do we have this metric and we have another one similar. So that's why it's really important to validate them in the first place. Yeah. I don't know if, if you might not agree, right? But it's my <laughs> own. So any more questions? Please. Do you have any recommendations for tracking? For? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if I want to have more, more than this for the error. Mm -hmm. Repeat the question. Sorry? Repeat the question. Ah, yeah. Uh, so the, the question was uh, if um, how to create metrics for reconcile errors. Uh, so basically, uh, that, uh, that example was very simple, but imagine you had an error. Usually, uh, exit the, the reconcile loop with an error, right? And uh, there I had. Just uh, this, uh, 
é this just the operator matrix. So reconcile count. But I, I could create a new one, like reconcile error count. And uh, in our loop uh, here, uh, I, do, I perform some operations that throws an error. And I just create that new metric, like increment uh, reconcile error count. No, that was. Sorry? Not all the errors for the alerting for the, like, uh, ah, but this, uh, yeah, yeah, but you can have, uh, create any metrics you want, right? You might, you might want to have uh, uh, an error that uh, was, you could not connect to an external provider. An error that's just, uh, uh, you can create any metrics for the granularity you want. Because metrics are really cheap and you can, uh, and you should create the metrics you need to then help you debug, actually. But then, when creating the alert based on those metrics, we should be more, more careful, right? Some of the errors might not be worth to, um, to, to alert for because it might come from user configuration, that uh, it was not able to create the resource with the properties it shows. So that might be a, like a warning or an info alert for, for them. But yeah, my, my advice would be create all the metrics you want because if you think that information is valuable, create the, the metric. The alert, you should be a little bit more careful. Yeah. Any more questions? So I think this is it. Thank you, everyone, for being here.